Okay, thank you, everyone. Um, I'm going to start sharing my screen now. So I'll just start on this. So just a bit of background, I guess. Um, I recently joined Lancaster University and the ARC, so I've only been part of um, the ARC since about the end of April. And just a bit about um, the material I'm presenting today. This was originally developed as part of a CPD course for um, public health practitioners, and I've kind of just modified it slightly. So it's a part of a course that's looking at policy evaluation techniques. So it covers different um, quasi-experimental methods, such as difference and difference, reg regression discontinuity and in interrupted time series, which are typically used um, in public health evaluation. So it's meant to be a kind of introduction to these so that people working in public health practice could be able to interpret models. And I was just say, I see things, um, yeah, coming up in chat. If I, I guess, if anything comes up, raise your hand or somehow just shout because I might not hear you. So please just interrupt me if you want to. Okay, now let's see if we can get the slide to work. Okay, so then starting, um, so why is it important for um, people to be able to understand statistical analysis? So in order to be able to make informed decisions um, and use evidence, it's essential to be able to understand the statistics behind headlines, health policy, and academic articles. So here are just three examples of um, different headlines which involve statistics. We have obese children likely to die up to 20 years earlier than their healthy peers. Growing social and economic inequalities across Northwest England are directly impacting health. And we also have Blackpool as a hotspot for inequality and mortality, says Nobel Prize winner. But what does this all mean in practice? So there are a few um, basic rules to follow when you see kind of statistics in the press or in um, other types of articles. So first thing to do is to observe your feelings. So you have certain feelings when reading public health headlines, such as the ones presented on the slides below, um, before. For example, righteous anger, defensiveness, relief, if it's good news. And your reaction will influence how much you buy into the claim and use it in your practice, share with others or ignore it. And then there's just a quote from the physicist Richard Feynman, which says, you must not fool yourself as your easiest person to fool. So it's useful when reading these kind of statistics. A lot of people think of kind of numbers as objective, but they can also be very subjective to think about why what this headline means and um, how it's being used. So I'm going to, oh, I can't really stop sharing, I was gonna say, so this was kind of trying to be a slightly interactive thing. So I guess in a sense, um, so which of these two headlines would grab your attention? So we have A, so I guess for people online, if you think A would kind of make you, I guess, more incest or think about it more than raise your hand. So you have 12 million pounds spent by NHS di on diabetics who smoke. And the other option is B, if you NHS saves 12 million annually by beggars of private health insurance. So if you saw these two headlines, I guess, which article would you go in to read? Um, I guess for people online, if you would read A, could you raise your hand just so I can see? Or anyone, and also, um, Anyone in the room? I can see people. Okay, yes, so I see one hand. So anyone in the room as well, you could raise your hands because I can see, brilliant. And then I guess B, so would anyone read article, the second article based upon the headline? So I see one few hands there. Yeah, I can't see any hands in person. So it's just kind of thinking about because I guess, in relation to these articles to think about, so we can see that we have 12 million spent and 12 million pounds saved. And so thinking about kind of what that means in terms of what message you're trying to get across. And also another thing to think about if you were to read such headlines is to say, you know, it was 12 million pounds, a significant portion of the NHS budget. So what does this mean kind of for healthcare planning? Um, and 
those are kind of the initial points and kind of who wrote the article, who is it aimed at, um, and what is possibly their agenda in writing this article. So then um, moving on. So we have, be curious. So try to understand what you're being told. All statistical statements should make you think. Who claims it? Why? What does the number mean? And what are they not telling? So then the other thing to think about as well as in terms of those headlines or just kind of any other statistical article, of all the statistical claims in the world, you've found this one. Why is that? Where did it come from? Why are you seeing it? Could it be because of good PR? Is it publication bias? So a study confirming what we already know, such as smoking causes cancer, is unlikely to be published. But one that shows surprising results, such as eating chocolate every day reduces the likelihood of developing diabetes, is more likely to get media attention. Um, and that's quite, I guess, important to um, keep in mind because you, a lot of times, especially in nutri nutrition related research, you have very small samples and kind of sometimes surprising findings. They get a lot of press, especially if it's saying things such as, you know, something that's seen as not healthy could be very good that, that people like to hear things like that. So it gets reported, even if there might not be any causal relationship between eating chocolate and health outcomes. And as well, we have the idea that follow-up studies finding no effect. So if there was one study that found chocolate, eating chocolate every day reduced the likelihood of developing diabetes, and someone else did a follow-up study to test those um, findings and found there was no association between eating chocolate and diabetes, that study wouldn't get published. So there'd still be kind of um, in the public, I guess, imagination or public's thoughts, there would be that thinking that, oh, it's good if I eat chocolate every day because that means I'm less likely to develop diabetes, as that study um, showed. And then I guess the other thing to keep in mind is the Groucho Marx principle. So if the result is surprising or counterintuitive counter enough, it's most likely to be wrong. Okay, and then another thing to consider is to um, put the results into perspective. So this is just um, one example to work through. So there, um, I guess, is a push to kind of remove single-use plastics. And one of the big things, probably about two or three years ago, was um, takeaway coffee cups. There was a real move to kind of eliminate their use. And so this was this data comes from twenty, I think it's twenty eighteen. So at that point. UK threw away, on average, 2.5 billion coffee cups a year. So there's 365 days in a year, and approximately 65 million people in the UK, probably closer to 66. And if you do the basic sums, this equates to pretty much every person, no matter what age, throwing away one coffee cup per day per person. Because obviously you're going to have some people who throw away who have more than one and some people who have none, such as babies are probably not drinking very much coffee. So does this seem reasonable? Um, and then the other thing to think about, so I'd say on average that that does seem a reasonable um, sum, but then how much of total waste is kind of price of disposable coffee cups? So is this something that is a larger proportion of waste and other things that needs to be dealt with, or is it really a small proportion? So in order to make policy, you need to have kind of all these other things in mind when you see kind of these numbers presented. Okay. So then some other um, examples. So questions to ask yourself. So say going back to what we had um, on the first slide, if you wanted to understand the claim health inequalities, England's life expectancy gap is growing. So this is the article um, and we'll sh I'll share the slides so if anyone wants to look at this afterwards. So the kind of overall idea is that health inequalities are rising, but what does this mean? So how are they measuring health and who is being compared to make this um, judgment? So in the article, we can see that health is being measured by life expectancy and that there is a 9.7 year gap in life expectancy between men and living, women, between men living in the most and least deprived areas. 
and that was an increase of 110 days compared to the previous period, which was 2015 to 2017. So then going back to the title, we can say that they measure the growing health inequalities as saying that the gap in life expectancy has increased between um, 2018 to 2020 compared to 2015 to 2017. And that with, and then for women, there's a seven year gap between um, those in the most and least deprived areas, which was an increase of six months. Um, and that's quite a significant rise. Um, and this is also as well comparing 2015 to 20, 2015 to 2017 to 2018 to 2020. Um, and it's worth noting, though, that an important caveat of this is that the 2015 to 2017 findings included Wales, where they were excluded from the 2018 to 2020 um, figure. So what does excluding Wales mean for our interpretation of the findings? So does this mean that it's we're in a sense not comparing apples to apples, but apples to oranges, because how does Wales compare to England without this? Um, information, we don't know if necessarily that the rise in um, the gap in life expectancy is actually smaller than we thought um, because that of um, the inclusion and exclusion of Wales. And then the other thing to keep in mind is we have this problem with averages and medians. So most statistical analysis that you'll see will be reporting averages. And averages can be skewed by a few people at the street at the extremes. It's kind of like peering into a room through a keyhole. So the median tells us about the center of the distribution, but ignores everything else. If the top and bottom of the health distribution are increasing, but the average sags, median health gains will be rising, but median health will be falling, which means that it's very difficult to make any interpretation from looking at either averages or medians. Um, and then thinking again about life expectancy. So we have here some historical trends. So how does the numbers compare with previous trends? So we can hear, see here across different um, social classes, the gaps in life expectancy. And we can see that between 1982 to 2011, through pretty much all social classes, there was rising life expectancy and that there was a slight, there was a decrease in the gap between the highest and lowest social classes. But then we can see from here, this is from 2008 to 2020, that pretty much life expectancy growth stalled um, across most of the UK and that um, there were uh, differences in um, pretty much a gap between these different groups remain constant. But then the other thing to keep in mind is that this is not by social class, but by country. So how much can you say by comparing the two? Okay, and then the other thing we need to keep in mind is, is the presentation of results. So what's being left out? So we can see truncating accesses to make small changes look big. So you can see here that the accesses go up by really, really small amounts. So it looks like there's been a huge change in interest rates. When you have kind of a different axis, you can see that the change in interest rates is very minimal and that this presentation then can make people draw potentially incorrect conclusions or misleading or can lead to people making misleading conclusions. So the other thing we need to keep in mind is um, a variable can be statistically significant but have no practical importance. So for example, with the rise of very large data sets, um, where there's a larger sample size, um, then you can take advantage of greater degrees of freedom, which means it's easier for coefficients to be statistically significant, but that they actually have no clinical, economic, or social value in terms of the coefficient. Um, and this can be an issue with using administrative or big data. So this is just an example of that taken from um, some administrative data from Florida in the United States, where it was looking at how temperature at conception was associated with years of schooling. And they found that there was a significant association, but they had a data set of about 86 to 90,000, and that the coefficients are actually really small. So it's saying that temperature birth 
was um, led to an extra two months of schooling. But does that actually mean anything? And just because it's statistically significant, does it necessarily mean that policy should be made based upon that? And now this one, I'm going to try, see, let's see if it works. So this is one of my favorite videos about correlation versus causation, which is the other thing that we need to keep in mind. So hopefully this works. Welcome. I came here today to warn you about the dangers of ice cream. You may not be aware of this, but these innocent looking cones full of sweetness are one of the major causes of drownings. And I've got the numbers to prove it. So if you plot a graph of the number of ice creams that are sold, and you compare it with the number of drownings, you can see there is clearly an upwards trend. And I think it's very safe to conclude from this that we should ban ice cream because it's very dangerous. <laughs> Since you are all smart people, you've probably figured out there's something wrong with my example. What's really happening here is, of course, that there is an underlying factor, which is nice weather, you might have guessed it. And if the weather is nice, more people will go out swimming and unfortunately drown. And at the same time, more people will buy ice cream. And it's not the ice cream that's causing the drownings. And here it's really easy to see that there is something wrong. But Jumping to an incorrect conclusion about causality when you see a correlation is the most often made logical mistake. And today my goal is to make sure that in the future you can recognize this mistake. And I really hope you can avoid making it in the future for yourselves. And I'll do this by just giving some famous uh, examples. And the first one is really rather innocent. The fact is that married men live longer than single men. If you look at the statistics, you see that this is really happening. And uh, women's magazines, they like to conclude from this that marriage is very healthy for men because it makes them live longer. <laughs> well, a friend of mine, uh, he likes to joke that marriage mainly makes life seem longer, but <laughs> that's because his wife is... Um... <laughs> But so, can anyone guess what's going on here? Because there is a causal relation, but it's the other way around. The fact is that men who are healthy and rich and well-educated and have a much higher life expectancy, these are the men that are much more likely to find a wife. That's the way women are. And the guys who have a very low life expectancy, so they're unhealthy and poor, they are not as likely to get married. So it's the high life expectancy that is causing the marriage not the other way around. Well, and this, of course, you know, it's not so serious. No one will get married just because he read this. So let's move on to a more serious example. It was also more serious research. In Nature was a study in 1999 that showed that young kids who sleep with the lights on, that they have a much higher probability of becoming short-sighted later in life. Well, and the researchers, they were smart and they wrote very careful that they had found the correlation and they didn't know how the causal relation might work, but just to be sure they advised all parents to turn off the lights at night. And in the popular media, this became that bed lamps were night abuse, uh, children's abuse, and that it was very bad if parents used lamps in the bedroom. And many parents were worried. I can imagine if this would have happened when my son was sleeping with the lights on, I would have felt really bad. But luckily, the article had to be corrected the next week. And maybe some of you can guess, if there are biologists in the, in the audience, they know. Uh, Short-sightedness is genetic. And so it's parents who are short-sighted, and those are the parents who like to leave the light on in the bedroom. And they also are the parents who have short-sighted kids. So again, you know, a simple mistake, easy to make. Then what is, I think, uh, the worst example I know, I know many of them, I see at least one of these in the newspapers every week, but this is a classic one. In the 70s, researchers found that there's a very strong link between kids who do well in school, get good grades, and kids who have a high self-esteem. 
And they concluded from this that it's very important to make sure that young kids are you know, raised to be confident and proud of themselves, because if their self-esteem is high, the good results will follow. And this was what was told to parents, especially in the US, for generations, that just make sure that your kid is proud and confident, then all will turn out well. And many years later, someone did another study just to see in which direction the cause was working, and they found that it was in the opposite direction. So the good grades were causing the self-esteem, and self-esteem wasn't causing good grades, and it, wasn't the, it was even worse. So kids who are raised just to have high self-confidence and not excel at anything, it can be sports or music, doesn't have to be school, but kids who are just proud of themselves and then fail at everything, in the end they will have a very low self-esteem and not be able to make anything of their life. So so this was a very serious correlation mistake. And what I want for today is for you to remember that the next time someone wants to prove that there is a causal relation between something and something else, it can be anything. It can be vaccines and autism. It can be female bankers and the financial crisis. And if they point out to you that there is a very strong relation, remember that it's not enough to have a correlation. It gives a very good hint of what might be happening. But before you can... conclude that one thing causes something else, you need to know why it does and how it does. So when in doubt, just remember the ice cream. Thank you very much. Okay, um, so I hope everyone heard that. So just moving on. Oops, sorry. That's the wrong way. Um, so just to sum up, an important thing to keep in mind um, when looking at kind of any quantitative research is thinking, is a cause of the claim being made and is it justified? So it's important to keep in mind that statistics are a summary of a more complicated truth. So we have here just a very, very simple example, as well as the ones in the video that no exercise leads to weight gain. But as everyone knows, obesity is a very complex problem and it's not so simple and that that you know if you kind of follow this path then you're not going to be helping many people and most likely be contributing to health inequalities so then just now discuss some very basic ways to stop you estimating causal model so this is a kind of a complicated statistical term which altogether is called endogeneity bias and it's made up of three different components. So the first one we have is omitted variable bias. And that means that we have things that we can't control for in the model because we don't have the data or you can't measure them um, using quantitative data are correlated with your variables of interest. And because of this, then what you see in the estimation model will be biased. And then the other thing we have is a thing called measurement error. So that is where you have an error in how respondents reply to survey questions where they might not interpret it the way that the question was intended to be interpreted. Um, but this is only a problem if it's done systematically based upon um, the characteristics of people responding. Um, and there's ways that you can check for that. And then the other one we have is called reverse causality or simultaneity bias. And that is we're not clear if X causes Y or Y causes X. Um, and that estimating models either way will give you some sort of association, but you don't know you said, which led to which. Um, and then finally, we're, the next bit is we're gonna discuss some examples. And one of the easiest ways to kind of eliminate some of these biases that um, stop us from kind of understanding relationship between two factors is something called fixed effects, where that takes the means of all the variables that change over time, um, as well as the unobserved um, factors that are within the error term in your equations and removes that. So then you can estimate um, the relationship between two different, um, between the outcome and explanatory variables. So here are now, we're going to um, 
move into some group work and look at what we learned. So this is taken from two different papers. Um, the first one is looking at the impact of new labor's health inequality strategy on geographical inequalities and infant mortality. It is a time trend analysis. So first we're gonna look at what does the following graph show about trends in infant mortality rates between the most deprived decile and the rest of England. Um, and I'm going to stop sharing for a moment. And I was gonna say the next step is Katrina, did you want to kind of lead a discussion or how should we do the discussion? I, and then I seem to have frozen. Oh no, I'm not frozen anymore. And then um, I can kind of, if people want to put things in the chat then I can look at that. Um, and I just want to check, can everyone still see the slide? Yes, okay, brilliant. And online everyone can see it as well, hopefully. So, um, Okay, great. So I was going to say, uh, if anyone wants to put any comments into the chat for those online about kind of what they think when they look at the graph, how they'd interpret it. Sorry, can I just ask, can you hear us in the room? Yes. Smashing, okay, thank you. Hi. Hi, can you hear me? I think um, one of the issues is distinguishing what the lines are because they look the same um, on the screen. And I think Steve's asked uh, the question about which line is which. Yes, no, I realise it is. Um, so the bottom line is the rest of England and the top line is the bottom 20%. Okay, thank you. Okay, just in the interest of time, shall we move on to the next slide? So in this slide, we have, um, these are the coefficients. So in many cases, I guess graphs, I feel like are easier to interpret. So this is just what you found in the model. So what it does is it looks at the difference in infant mortality rates between the bottom 20%, as we saw in the graph, and the rest of it, um, England. So we can see that between 1983 to 1999, this coefficient is, um, there was a gap of uh, 0 0.034, and that this is the confidence intervals. A thing to keep in note is if the confidence interval does not go through one, that means it's statistically significant. Um, and so that the, in this one, we can see that because this is positive, that the infant mortality rate was growing between those in the bottom 20% and the top. So positive in this case means that it was increasing. And then we could see between this period here that um, it's negative. So that means it was decreasing. Again, it doesn't go through one. So you can say it's statistically significant. Um, and then we can look at Finally, this period here, we can see it's positive, um, but the confidence interval goes through one, so it's not statistically significant. Um, so overall, we could say that between 1903 and 1999, inequalities in infant mortality was increasing, they decreased, and there looks like just over this time, oops, sorry, Okay, between this time, we could see that they were increasing again, but it wasn't statistically significant. You can see from again, looking at this, that there's this uptick. So it's very possible that if we were to look at data from further on that that might be. And that's, I guess, a very quick whistle stop explanation of how to interpret these coefficients. And then there's just one more example. Um, Katrina, I don't know how much more time we have because we're supposed to be starting the next session in three minutes. So shall we carry on with that? Do we stop? Are you moving rooms? Because we can go through the next example or... I don't know kind of how the time 
has changed. Okay, so then this is uh, an example from a, another paper that we've done. The references are at the end, looking at local government funding and life expectancy, and it's um, a longitudinal ecological study. It employs similar methods to the other paper. And what it does is look at whether local um, authority areas that had greater reduction in two types of funding, um, which refer to central government funding between 2013 and 2017, had larger decreases in life expectancy and premature, premature mortality compared to those that didn't. And then here are just some graphs so we can see that um, this is the relationship between um, IMD and um, changes in life expectancy. So we can see um, that the light blue are the least deprived and the purple are the most deprived, but it doesn't look from here that there's any very clear pattern. This is for women, this is for men. But then when we look at um, it presented in a slightly different way, we compare the least and the most deprived, you can see more of a clear pattern emerging in terms of um, reductions in life expectancy. And then again, here are the coefficients. Um, so we can see that there was a decrease in life expectancy for both men and women by, for men, one, about one, just almost two, one and a half months, and for women, 1.19. Uh, these are both statistically significant. There was also a decrease um, in life expectancy, age 65, and um, a decrease in mortality, um, all cause mortality for those younger than 75, and that all of these were statistically significant um, according to the confidence intervals, and as well that these are p values, which is another way of indicating statistical significance. And then just so um, you have them, that these are the references from the papers that if you wanted to go and have a look. And then I'm just going to stop sharing to finish up so I can see better. Um, I was just gonna say, so kind of the takeaway messages from this are to, I guess that in some ways, qualitative and quantitative research are not so different is that, you know, there's, people behind all the research and there's reasons for the research um, being publicized. So just keep that in mind when reading statistics and thinking about kind of how you can interpret statistical coefficients given the context that they're presented and what that means. Um, and as well, thinking about how possibly you can use some of these findings in your practice and by understanding some of the weaknesses and strengths of the findings. Does anyone have any questions, comments, thoughts? And I'm sorry that it was kind of very quick and it's slightly disjointed because it's hard to do it online and in person. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you so much for attending and um, hope you enjoy the rest of the day.